Well, hey, Marty, how's it going? Hey, John, it's going well. Did you travel well this last week? I did. I was all wrapped up with gloves and I had like a face mask and no one was coughing on me. I'd go to a gas station. It would be like I got the pump, wipe my hands off, like cover myself in alcohol. Not while I'm driving, <laughs> but uh, 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 it was a it was a quick trip and it was a safe one and and uh, yeah everything everything went really sw uh, went really smoothly. Um, great, great. I'm glad, I'm glad you to made get it. Home, you know, it's just like everything's happening. I got you know um, you know the the coffee roaster moving into my house. I got this nine foot cupping table right behind me. My classic nine foot cupping table I've had since 2010 from Cultiva back in the day. Still have that. And you're living you're living the coffee guru's dream. Roaster, the, the coffee, coffee equipment hoarder's dream because I'm <laughs> I've got like a uh, a pastry case also here right here it's like okay. one of those that you could find like a, it's like a grab and go cooler and then on the top it's for dried storage that one's for sale too by the way you're just gonna and, put a sign out front well out front I got a three part sink <laughs> on my porch and then I also have an under counter true refrigerator but that's in my dining room so uh, yeah you know, I, I uh, that's that's my life, Marty. Um, but yeah, so for everybody who's who's new to this and who thinks I'm just hoarding coffee equipment, uh, my name is John Ferguson, and I uh, I uh, I'm here mainly because of the SCA uh, volunteer leadership uh, role that I have uh, with the U.S. chapter to kind of engage in coffee uh, topics and, and uh, gather people together to talk about uh, all things coffee, but specifically with you, Marty about coffee technology, I suppose. And I, I wanna broaden this from like seed to cup, talking about depulpers all the way to, uh, I don't know, uh, different types of brewing techniques uh, and different types sure. of technology that, that kind of bring the coffee. Absolutely. So who are you? Oh, and, and did I mention I worked at the Arbor Day Foundation, Arbor Day Coffee, and this Friday we're launching a brand new coffee. I, I, I gotta do the sales pitch. Right? It's like <laughs> one of the best coffees. It's the best coffee we've ever launched. And it has the, the best um, uh, roasting uh, profile. It's a really nice, nice light roast. It accentuates all the, the, the finite uh, attributes of this coffee. It's uh, from the Catracha community in, in Honduras and Santa Elena through Myra Powell, who, who uh, uh, has, has worked with Royal Coffee to bring this uh, to us in the United States. Um, and then also uh, folks at uh, Caldi's in St. Louis have been uh, Gracious enough to to roast on a on a UG twenty two probat from uh, nineteen something or other long time ago before I was born. That's how old it is. O over than fifty years old, I'm pretty sure. But so Marty, you're in Kansas City. Sure. Uh, I would just want to say thank thank you, John, for for all you do for the SEAA and the uh, and just keeping communication alive uh, uh, through your role with that. Um, and it sounds like you've got some powerhouse people on that that. Uh, offering that Arbor Day is doing. Um, I've, I've oh, got to get me some. Yeah, I've got to get I'll me get some. I'll get you one. I'll get so, you one. no, I am I am Marty Rowe. I'm out of Kansas City. We own Workbench Coffee Labs, a training facility for the the uh, uh, wannabe and or uh, veteran technician that turns wrenches. Or you might actually be someone that just wants to keep their coffee equipment running. We, we, uh, we can help you out with that, too. Um, on the training, the technical side of it. Now that's our, our main focus for this this year. That was going to be our 2020 launch to really take work, Workbench into uh, the quintessential premier technician training facility. And, hey, that's, and where all, that's where I got my That's where I got my right? Well, exactly. Um, so so we, uh, we still have the, the lab that uh, is uh, certified to, to do the Q grader training, um, but we're, we're going to focus on, uh, continue focusing on the technical side of it because there's uh, hey. not, not that many people out there doing that. So that's what we're going to do. And you do service calls pretty much every day, all Absolutely. seven days a week, 24 hours, maybe not. I don't know. Are you doing 3 a.m. calls? <laughs> Some, sometimes it, it does get into that, but fortunately- Is that like triple, uh, quadruple time? Like how much do you charge? <laughs> For, you know, I we, want you to come out to my house at 4 a.m. in the morning because my I might have a leaky faucet. Is it well, like a chances are, hour? John, if if you get me out at four in the morning, it's because I like <laughs> you, 
and, and right. so I'm, yeah, I'm doing it more of a as a, a but friend you're still than probably, someone. But you're still up playing guitar. You're, you're playing your power chords. Probably too many yeah. power chords. Right? Let's talk about. <laughs> I want to talk about power chords a little bit. Yeah. Anybody yeah. that knows me knows that 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 my Facebook and Instagram has dabbled with a, a lot of stuff, and and guitars is one of them. So yeah, like over here in this graphic, I think I'm pointing the right direction. It's See that? I yeah. have really no idea. We've got is, power is that chords. You? And we got power chords. No, these are free, uh, what do they call it? Common license, freeware photos. Okay. There's a guy who's playing uh, a power chord. And then we have some power chords underneath it that are plugged in yeah. with uh, possibly too many. Um, I don't know. Do you think that that looks legit or should, should you kind of not do that? It, if you're in a cafe? it, it looks somewhat typical. Uh, it's not right, but it's somewhat typical. Um, <laughs> What well, what was that? Uh, there's a couple movies uh, that that reminds me of. Um, one of them is the Christmas Story. Oh, and then um, Bill and Ted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Christmas Vacation. And, the yeah, Christmas there's... Story. Yeah, it's a it's a disaster waiting to happen. And let's exactly. talk about disasters, right? My first slide. What happened oh, here? I remember this call. Why do you remember I, this call? Well, <laughs> like, because you would have done that. Who would have who would have given you this? Like, uh, um, and and don't feel bad, John. You're not the first one to have this happen. Um, oh, I don't feel bad at all, Marty. Not at all. I feel I feel um, that I should have been more uh, prepared for this situation, um, and I feel that I need to learn how to communicate better with people that are building out coffee shops. Um, I don't feel bad, but I I definitely learned my lesson, 100%. Well, on, on electricity, you need to understand if you don't know what you don't know, it can be very dangerous. Well, what's going on here? What happened? Uh, what happened? To well, that, uh, thing? cut to the chase on that. There's an awful lot of uh, brewing equipment out there that it it can be a, a high voltage unit, the whole unit. And for example, this is a 220 volt unit. But there's some components inside that that don't run on 220. They run on 120. Um, and so um, by virtue of how it's wired, um, you send 120 where it needs 120. You send 220 where it needs 220. Um, again, you need to know what you're doing to be able to do that. Um, but what I'm seeing there is a transformer um, on the main control circuit board that obviously due to a miswire miscommunication and where the wires land on the cord coming into it, uh, that transformer was sent 220 volts um, and uh, it's not designed for that. It's one of the components that runs on 110, 110, 120. Well, that's kind of what happened. This is a, this is a new build out. They had a FECO 2, uh, what, like 2032 uh, E, e uh, something like that. And then it was, uh, um, I think it was, the, you know, a, a new rough in and, uh, the machine was there and the, the, the plate was there with the electronic, you know, with the, with the information uh, as to like what it was uh, supposed to be drawing. But the, the, the plug in the wall had, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, three phase. Well, it could have had three phase on it. So here's, here's the deal, John, the lesson for this, I don't care if you're a, a rookie, uh, a shop owner or a veteran electrician that's looking this up, your best friend is your meter. So that you can verify specifically what you're sending to this this piece of equipment. Meet, uh, meet, so, who, meet, meet who? <laughs> so so let me throw you under the bus. Did anybody throw a meter on that outlet and the, and test anything to see what what we were sending to this before we plugged it in, or did we assume that the electrician I don't know, was Martin. there plug that? I, I, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't there and I didn't plug it in and it was turned that's, on when I got there. All I know is that I, I dropped off a unit there uh, a couple of weeks prior and yeah. they built it out, plugged it in, and they, they said that there were some issues. With it after we would be talking this time still tomorrow if I, if I discussed every time uh, something like this I've seen remnants of. And I think that I think that, that you're making a great point. The first thing you always need to do is never trust anything and always just run a meter. Uh, I don't I don't outlet. trust me. I, I can wire something up, but before I actually heat it up, I, I check and this it. was not yep. my first accident. You know, you thought you think I would learn by now. There was another brewer up in uh, Minneapolis. I was working for Dogwood up there and it was just a, a quick 
a quick little um, install. Uh, I had to, you know, put the put the pigtail on it and and, and the and the, uh, the receptor, the male receptor. It was wiring it up, and uh, one of the wires kind of, I, I guess, um, one of the one of the hot, the black hot wire, uh, got a little. I guess it might have gotten crimped uh, a little bit and opened up okay. that wire and then when i when i went ahead and plugged it in sparks flew a uh, little puff of black smoke and i i thought wow they must have wired something wrong in there <laughs> and yeah then I sometimes that it was, uh, yeah it was me so. was it stranded wire that you, you had a little hair coming off of it is that what that was i think so um yeah. nothing got uh nothing was damaged and no one got hurt and uh the, sure. the it just brushed off but i was I feel like people really need to call you, Marty, um, even if they know everything about coffee like me. You, yeah, you, you better watch yourself. And you realize quickly you don't know half. half Whether it's, it's me or, or the like of me. I mean, there's some great technicians out there. Of course, absolutely. I mean, you can't and, fly to New Jersey every time someone needs you. Um, now, I also will say I've seen some do it yourselfers here lately replace there, power cords on their that's equipment. That's what this is. This is a do it yourselfer. Uh, there you go. That's a do it yourselfer. Um, but I had one recently that he had changed the cord coming in um, to it, and he didn't. He did a great job. It looked good. It was too small of a cord, though. So rule of thumb on this to always remember coffee equipment draws a lot of amperage, draws a lot of power. It needs a lot. Um, I don't know how many meetings I've been into and, and describe what kind of power service we need for what, what they're describing they're wanting to do. And the electricians just shake their heads sometimes if they don't know the coffee world. Um, yeah. So it, yeah. Um, well, so this is, this is an espresso machine hookup too. I don't know, did I show this one to you already? Um, if I re remember right, this was, you didn't go into a lot of detail. This is a cart. You see, um, my, uh, you see right. my little pointer? Uh-huh, I do. Screen here. I don't know. That is a 220 line going in there. And it goes down here. And this is the 110 going out here. So what they did okay. is they just kind of bypassed the whole thing and they just kind of were able to just kind of loop it around there in the box. I never did hear an outcome on, on that. Did, did you get an outcome because here's you the income here, here's instead of the outcome here's here's the inside of it um, okay and uh see the, the we got the kind of just yeah um well the outcome was this marty they uh, the generators um were unable to generate uh 220. okay so they had two 110 generators Yes, that could talk to each other, but they still they boosted up the power, but not the voltage. I, I yeah, absolutely. I, I and that. I and I I was uh, again. I listened and I assumed that that is what I was getting. So therefore, the espresso machine wasn't working and something was wrong with it. But I couldn't pull uh, it out of the wall because it was hardwired into this box. Sure. So I couldn't test the, you know. Yeah. So I had to go to the I had to go to this box and it and it was it was it was only running 110 and I'm thinking that well there's something's wrong. But anyway, this is a new challenge for you, Marty. I thought this would be kind of fun, right? I'll give you schematics of a machine and you get four slides and you got to tell me what what it is. We got to tell everybody. I I've, I've never seen any of this. You you always throw this stuff at me. I'm, right. And it's it's all this, this is the, this is this is a good one because it's uh, okay. How many slides will it take for Marty to identify what this is? Uh, now we have a special I'll... guest today, Dan Reagan, who's going to be joining us after this little thing. And I bet you, if you can't get it, Marty, I'm going to hand it over to Dan to see if he can get it. Okay. Because okay. He, he might he might have more familiarity over this stuff. Uh, and and that's that's okay. fair enough. You got five okay. seconds. What is it? <laughs> well, that is a chassis for some sort of brewing machine, and there's a motor up on top, uh, a gearbox. Uh, should I should I just kind of? You can you can try it. it. You got yeah. you got three more slides. You want to just what is it? That that's a some sort of single cup brewing device oh man it only took like one slide all right two well, slides keep going. let's me, see if i can nail it down uh, tell me tell me what brand it is uh i don't know we've got a flow meter so that can that just confirms 
um, that this is a some kind of single cup um, bean to cup type device. Where's your flow meter? Um, Tell me where the flow meter is. The lower right hand corner. Right there? Yeah. Hey, I, I know what a flow meter is. Look at that. <laughs> Just it's prior to that as a, as a water valve. So um, yeah, what, what else have you got there? Well, what kind of single? Like, what, what are you what are you talking about? Uh, I, I, got, I don't know. It's it's. Here's I one. don't see any grinders or anything. So it's going to be either a, a K cup or a pod or a something that's packaged. Um, otherwise, it would I would have seen some sort of grinder um, for fresh grind. Uh, right. Again, I'm not seeing anything. And that. What is that this stuff? That okay, upper left hand corner. That's your. That's a brew chamber of some sort there. I'm not familiar with this particular piece of equipment, but that that is definitely a pod chamber. Um, so this is a pod machine. How am I doing? You're doing great. Actually, I think before I, I, I uh, release what this actually is, I think I want to have Dan just get a shot at this. Yeah, if you know abso it is. absolutely. So we're going to invite Dan Reagan to the show. Dan, uh, quick introduction, who you are, where you work, and what do you do? And, and tell me. All right. Um, tell me I'm Dan Reagan. Is. Yeah, I'm with Podpack International. Uh, been in the business a while. This is the uh, Bun Autopod Brewer. Awesome. Yeah. This one? We the My Cafe AP is Autopod. Yep. Autopod. There it is. Hey, is Dan. That? <laughs> Can I just jump in here, save save myself a little bit? We we have installed a few of these, but I've got to I've got to admit I've never been in inside one. Well, further than just minor stuff. Um, so I'm I'm kind of anxious to to learn about it. This is great. Yeah, I, I I thought you know you know Marty and Dan that the specialty coffee industry rarely ever talks about. Uh, different types of packaging solutions, if you want to call it that, or different types of uh, methods of uh, single cup brewing. I mean, we're, you know, we're doing K cups. We do a couple of different things, but I think getting down to the nitty gritty of like, what are what are these, you know, what are these things that we do, and where where are they uh, where are they applicable, and where are they not applicable, and 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 uh, what's the business behind this, and is there room for improvement, and can we find a way to make these uh, can we get someone to put really excellent coffee in these and can it be brewed with the same amount of excellence that it was put into the roasting and the sourcing of the coffee? Sure, and, absolutely. Uh, I think so, we're going to get it at, to the podfather, Dan Reagan. Welcome to the club. Welcome to this world. And I know you've been in this world for what? Uh, you've been in coffee for uh, a couple of years? 43, 43 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Indeed. You don't look that old in this, this, the <laughs> camera is doing you really good. Lucky Thanks. me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Marty. Oh, you weren't talking to me, were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You look at great Dan. Look at great. So like, yeah, tell us all about that. So the, yeah. the brewing technology and, and the format of the product uh, are really important. Uh, it's, it's really all about the engineering of the product. Uh, and when we're engineering products, what we like to do is look at, uh, you know, where the expertise is in the industry. So if you're wanting to know about expertise in the industry, you obviously look at the Specialty Coffee Association and determine uh, what it is that they're saying is a good quality product. And uh, we recognized early on that the Golden Cup standard was something that was achievable. Uh, because of the engineering of the equipment and the pod itself. So the, the engineering of the brewer is that, one, it's brewing at 200 degrees. So unlike some other single cup devices that are brewing at 185, it's really hard to get the extraction rate and yield from a product if you haven't got the right water temperature to start with. There's a really important part of brewing called the pre-infusion that allows the coffee to bloom prior to the full brew occurring. And of course, the other side of it is uh, you have to make it convenient for the consumer. It's really cool if you have uh, all this stuff, but if it takes five minutes, why not just make a pot of coffee? And so we, we determined that the pump technology 
uh, pushing through this coffee bed with a pre-infusion and 200 degree water would allow us to grind coffee at a certain micron with a certain dose to achieve a, an extraction rate and yield. So everything gets measured out to come as close as possible to this golden cup standard. Uh, most coffees do, some are, are a little bit shy, but uh, the majority of them are, are legitimately hitting this golden cup target. And it has a lot to do uh, with the two groups coming together, the equipment manufacturer and the, the pod manufacturer. So we were able to manage that in, in that fun uh, My Cafe Autopod because it has that pressure. If we're talking about that versus an in-room pod, and so a lot of people know pods because they travel around in hotels and, and they've got these little Hamilton Beach or Mr. Coffee or Cuisinart Brewers right. that, that have uh, no pressure. They're all automatic drip. It's a three minute brew. And when the coffee blooms, it expands so much in the pod that if you put as much coffee in a, a non-pressurized as you do a pressurized brewer, it simply won't brew the coffee. And they kind of uh, look the same too, right, Dan? I mean, like if you put them side by side, one might have a little bit more of a, an ability to have a, 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 a heavier throw weight so you can get a couple more grams of coffee in there versus the in-room pods where... Um, it, what are the limitations of this tech? I, I, I might be jumping ahead a little bit here. I, I do want to talk about this, but I wanted to get through this slide really quick so we can kind of move on to the next slide. But I wanted to kind of preface this for everybody else in the world that's not familiar with any sort of like other than ground coffee from the grocery store, right? We've sure, got, and that... Yeah, so the first... The real the difference... Line, yeah. The real difference in volume uh, in the pod, and, and keep in mind what we're measuring is bulk density that goes into a space. That's what pod pack does. So you can only fit so much into a, a space. And if you're using a very dark rose coffee, the bulk density is completely different than a very light rose coffee. So in a hospitality pod, you might get eight grams of a dark roast, maybe nine and a half grams of a light roast. Whereas in a commercial brewer with pressure, you can get uh, 10 and a half grams of dark roast and up to 12 and a half grams of a light roast. Yeah. So, well, so while that. So for, for the, for the pods, um, you know, we, we've got the, the commercial versus the interim, which we talked about. And then we have all these other products that are kind of like, um, uh, I don't want to talk about like, what, what is a steeped coffee? Steeped coffee is basically coffee in a tea bag. And that has a different type of extraction um, uh, process that's uh, kind of full immersion and it's a little bit more manual with hot water. We're not going to talk about that today, but that is one way of doing a single cup. And these, those are also nitrogen flush, which we kind of talked about on the next slide about what you also do with, the, with these pods. And then there's single cups. Everybody's kind of familiar with them. They call it K-cups, but because of uh, a lot of the things that uh, you have taught me in the past, you're the one who told me that there, there's some uh, uh, changes in... Uh, uh, legalities to where you can kind of uh, explore that a little bit differently. We'll talk about that however you want to word it. Then we have like fractional packs, but some people call them pillows, some people call them open brew, but they're all basically a, a small pack of ground coffee that's made for not necessarily a single cup, although you could do it a single cup and then have a number four filter paper cone, but they're made for like a single pot of coffee. And then you have ground bulk coffee, like your regular pound of ground coffee or a pound of whole bean, and then you have these bean-to-cup brewers that use the whole bean to make the coffee. And then now that that technology is out there to do um, like a, a single cup brewers, right? The cool thing yeah. I've learned about is like nitrogen flushing, I, in my mind, I think it works. I think it actually works. I want to get your opinion on that too. But remember, Marty, how everybody talks about like in the barista competitions, they say, immediate insert and brew. It's an aspect of the barista competition. You immediately take it from your grinder uh, you grind it and you immediately insert into the espresso machine so you can have that ultimate freshness. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the word. That's the right? thought process. So I think that that thought process can be applied here with the nitrogen flushing and the single cup aspect where each one of these are sealed individually from the time that they were ground, immediately nitro flushed and nitrogen flushed. And then uh, once it's opened, it's immediately brewed, immediately insert and brew. And you're going to get a surprisingly, and I mean, I'm putting my name out there, you're going to get a surprisingly fresher cup of coffee than you thought you might be getting. 
So with that being said, Dan, I want to talk, let's talk about the technology that you have on this slide. Marty, if there's anything you want to say, uh, jump right in now. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Dan, Dan, yeah. the floor is yours. So this and is I what you send to me. You send this to me every time you manufacture something. This is what you call quality control from a quality company, giving you quality data. I love it. Why do you and do this? Well, so one of the most challenging things, I'd like to back up just a second and say that one of the most challenging things when you're nitrogen flushing uh, very fresh roasted coffee is that you have to allow the product to degas. And, what, and people that don't allow the product to degas correctly uh, before packaging will have all sorts of problems with uh, how the thing pillows up, which is why they call them pillow packs, because that, that degassing process hasn't completed. And if it's not degassed correctly prior to brewing, if you go straight from roasting right to brewing, sometimes you're compromising how much you can actually get off of the coffee because the CO2 is stopping the process from happening, the extraction of the coffee from happening. It's kind of an interesting and challenging thing. Um, not impossible if you've got pressure though. So if you're talking about an espresso competition where you roast it, uh, grind it and throw it right in an espresso machine and lock that in and use pressure to, to power through it, you'll get the good uh, extraction and an extremely fresh product. But you do that with a batch brew, uh, open brew, fractional pack. Uh, it's very challenging because the, the coffee... Um, won't be able to sit long enough. The water won't sit long enough. You need a longer water contact time, in other words. So anyway, but, but PodPack does this uh, uh, results testing. And the reason we do it is uh, we want you to, to see the level of engineering that goes behind getting a single cup of coffee out. People send us coffee from all over the country and we build specs from their coffee. That spec is tested every time a new batch of coffee comes in. So if I'm, if I'm working with uh, a national brand, if I'm working with a, a national roaster or even uh, small roasters, when they send us coffee, we measure the coffee, we measure the agtron and the bulk density, and that's done on a particle analyzer. So we're getting good data to uh, make sure that the product is gonna correlate into uh, a certain yield of product in the, in the cup for the consumer. The, I, the next, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. The, the next thing that we're going to do based on that agtron and bulk density is determine a micron size, particle micron size, because uh, depending on the format that we're putting it in, if we're doing an espresso pod, you might be in the 380 range. If we're doing a cold brew pod, you may be in the thousand micron range because the cold brew process is quite different with no pressure, just sitting and steeping. Uh, overnight. So um, so we have to, to determine those things. Now, the weight is determined by what's going to fit in the format that we're producing. This particular uh, sheet is showing a hospitality pod, and it's not too dark a coffee. That's actually a, a medium, medium light uh, coffee. Uh, 8.3 grams was what was going to fit correctly and brew. If we, so if we went to 8.7 grams, for instance, if we, we added 5% to this, your yield would probably drop. And the reason it would drop is because this is a three minute brew, 206 seconds, uh, which is the brew time there. And what happens after the coffee blooms and fills the pod area, the water finds the path of least resistance and just goes around it. So you want to make sure that the coffee gets immersed correctly using the right volume of coffee to get the right extraction out of the product. So you're seeing a, a pod weight of 8.3, and that is the tear weight, uh, 8.3, an 8-ounce brew, a brew time of 206 seconds. It was done, uh, if there was a, a upper portion of this page, it would have shown you that it was brewed on a Hamilton Beach, uh, probably HB200, uh, C or something like that. And then what the resulting TDS was, which is 0.74. So the, the challenge in a hospitality pod is the, the gram weight that we can throw uh, and the, the process. So 
you probably have a slide that shows a different product that uh, that we've created to make a better experience for the consumer, and and that's called a SuperPod. So this SuperPod is quite a bit larger than the other pod, but still fits in that Hamilton Beach, Cuisinart, uh, Mr. Coffee machine that's uh, standard uh, availability from those manufacturers. The SuperPod is a 72 millimeter diameter versus a 61 millimeter diameter. That's going to allow us to put about 20% more coffee into the pod. We can get up to 11 grams of the same coffee into that pod. And of course, the result is that you're getting a much better TDS, much higher quality product in the cup, and, and much higher satisfaction from the consumer. So since these are mostly made in the hospitality world, uh, consumer feedback has been relatively important. Um, the real issue is, though, that a lot of times we go straight to the cheapest price, the lowest price we can find. If you could scoop a, a little uh, half a teaspoon of dirt into a pod and only charge uh, and charge four cents less, a lot of times they'll buy that because they're selling uh, thousands of them a day in some cases. Uh, typically, and, and just to give you an interesting statistic, which is... Um, We've found over time, if you have a, a pod brewer in a hotel room, uh, you're probably based on occupancy rates, and this is pre-COVID, by the way, uh, but based on occupancy rates and other things, you're probably using a half a pod per room per day, so 165 cups per year. That, that can... Uh, that can be figured uh, many different ways. That's an average. So some some places have much higher occupancy, other places have lower. Uh, but that would just be a national average. Um, and I, when you put and, and I was I, I kind of had some questions technically about this product, sure. and, and it's just a burning question. You know, like uh, what makes it impossible to put twelve grams of coffee? I mean, how can we make these more? fitting to a market that demands a higher TDS or brew ratio. And I know the super pod you said brings out a, a more substantial TDS. Um, what, what, and that's due to some pressurization in the machine. I'm thinking actually the super pod doesn't need any pressurization. It's got enough space inside the pod because the format is uh, uh, 11 millimeters uh, larger diameter. So it goes from 61 millimeter up to 72 millimeter. And, and that extra space is what, what allows us to put more coffee in the pod uh, and, and use still a hospitality brewer. A little uh, $20 brewer from Hamilton Beach can actually brew a Golden Cup product out of the Super Pod. And it's just because the space allows the water to completely penetrate all of the coffee and to extract efficiently from that. Do you think that, that it's possible that like some manufacturing company uh, that could tool a piece of equipment that, or, and, and also manufacture a pod that has 23 grams of coffee in it, like in the morning, I basically use 23 grams of coffee and I make about uh, this size of a cup, right? I like a little thick. It probably comes out to about a one to 16 ratio, which is probably uh, pretty average for the specialty coffee world. Um, what's keeping that from happening? And how can we get there? And, and Marty, have you seen anything out there? Like, have you seen this kind of technology? And what's your experience with pods? Well, just like everyone else, you know, we've seen what's out there, uh, the K-cup or the pods and things like that. And the, the physical limitations seems to be um, what we're up against to try for us to get a, what we would call a decent ratio um, is the design of the equipment that's limiting it to you know, I, I see out there basically about a maximum of about 11 grams what anybody's putting in anything. Um, um, but I, I do agree with Dan that 11 grams is, is will produce a pretty decent cup, but not a cup the size you're drinking and not the cup that I drink every morning. Um, I'm, I'm doing 30 grams, but I'm, I'm doing I'm doing a cup and I've got a container of left over there. So I'm 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 almost two full cups. Um, but you don't do like, doing, 16, like a sixteen ounce, maybe. That's that's about what I'm doing. And, yeah. So uh, so and the super pod you're saying, Dan, you can get pretty close to that. As far the as the super pod, 
in in pressurized brewing we can go up to about 16 grams so that would be the max fill for the super pot have you seen a well, lot of higher end specialty coffee companies i mean other than the arbor day foundation obviously we are the best in the world right i love it anyway well good stuff but like do you, do you see other coffee roasting companies exploring this and what are the challenges that kind of face them as far as like top-notch ethiopian natural process you know like an 89 you know on a maybe how about a 90 plus coffee right and it's a risk because it's an expensive coffee and then they get a nitrogen not roasted yesterday um why, why aren't people doing it is it because well, so so it's done on a on a smaller scale typically the local roasters that are uh, managing local five-star hotels and things like that. The the five stars uh, would like to bring in the, the five stars would like to bring in a uh, a higher quality product and a local product. So uh, that's where the business comes from for that super pod in the hospitality world, uh, and and it's speckled around the country, quite frankly. But when you're talking about the larger uh, national companies, uh, trying to do something like that is very, very challenging region by region by region because they're packing out product at much lower volumes than they would for, say, a, a Holiday Inn or a Hilton or a Marriott. In, in that case, you're packing out millions and millions of units, and it's a very price-sensitive thing. But if you're talking Talking about the JW, uh, maybe they've got something a little bit nicer in their rooms, and maybe they're coming up with better solutions for the guests that are paying uh, $600 a night and higher, uh, and they are coming up with better solutions. But typically that comes from a local roaster who sends us coffee in small batches, and we pack it out for them, ship it back to them. Uh, it is a little higher cost if it's a small batch, but typically those hotels are willing to uh, willing to handle that uh, extra cost. It's still uh, not over the top considering they're uh, a higher price hotel. Uh, you might be talking about uh, maximum cost with a high grade coffee going into a pod of something like around 80 cents. So it's not like it's going to $7. Uh, it's 80 cents if they have three packs in that room that they're charging $500 a night for. Uh, I, as a consumer, would appreciate something better like that in my room. Uh, now, now, Dan, the, the, can I jump in here just a second? What we're, what we're all dancing around and what John was dancing around is something that here in the U.S. we kind of tend to do. We've supersized everything. Um, I, I totally get that we can get that john ferguson quality cup of coffee in the morning if we just decide to to do a six ounce or no more than an eight ounce out of one of the pieces of equipment you're talking about um uh and if you need more make another cup uh and isn't that a, a pretty decent answer to that challenge um rather than reinventing the wheel so that we can have a 16 ounce cup of and coffee Dan. in the morning and, and Marty, I think I think you made a great point there, Marty. Like I was thinking, like you know, uh, if you had one of those in-room service things, you know, and and you could maybe just brew like a four-ounce cup. Would, exactly. Would would brewing half the amount of water though, Dan, through that through that pod extract a higher TDS because you're sending less water through it, or is it, or is it more nuanced with how the extraction works because you actually need to balance the amount of water that's hitting the bed and the amount of right time. so so you gotta uh, the flow rate then you're gonna have to slow the flow rate down maybe right and smaller tube and, and keep in mind we're we're talking about products that are engineered to make eight ounces so if you're going to make four ounces you've got to grind it differently there are some different aspects because your water contact time is going to be much less so it's it's that's really where the problem is is the water contact time and again just similar to freshly roasting coffee and throwing it right into a brewer and brewing it that co2 degassing limits how you can extract if you don't have pressure behind it so it's not it's not different if uh, somebody came to me and said look we just want to run four ounce cups out of this pod we'd design the pod a little bit differently 
as far as what the grind particle size is and whether or not the product's densified. There are some other techniques that you can use that enhance the, the cup. Uh, but what we're asked most of the time and what most coffee brewers, uh, uh, machines are brewing are eight ounces. If you put 12 ounces into that Hamilton Beach, it's going to spill all out the back from in the, you know, be a mess in the hotel room. Well, I'll I also, just I, I, I would like to also say like the difference between like a, a 185 Kalita or a 155 and the amount of coffee you were to put into something like that, what would be that? difference because usually with those types of pour overs you know like yeah you'll see like 26 27 to 30 grams into it but with those smaller like 155s i know you're you're putting way less coffee in your brew time's way shorter um yeah and i i suppose i can see that scaled down with the pods as well yeah i think i think it's really interesting like how can we um you know, I just had this crazy idea of like a Big Mac, right? Like you've got like a like like a hamburger is not enough. You need to get like a, a a double hamburger or a triple hamburger. And could you just have three different like little slides, and then the water just passes through each one? I mean, I mean, I, is that just kind of like you have to retool the whole thing, or is that just like a crazy idea? Just make the pod bigger. Well, so actually, yeah. And, and I and think that the whole conversation about this, Dan, is the slides that you made that I have on, it says home office coffee services. I think you see that, right? Mm -hmm. When you put this together kind of last minute, and I called you today at four, and was like, hey, do you want to be on the show tonight at seven and talk about pods? Because I had some really engaging conversations about office coffee services are now catering to people that are at home. So where's that transition? How's it working? What kind of equipment? are people going to need for that transition to a pour over, which I can do all day, every day. But I know that there are people that I work with in the office that just, they just don't want to, you know, some people like nice cars and they go out and buy a nice car. Some people ride a bike because they just don't want a car, right? Some people just don't care about coffee, but they still want to drink something. And they're okay with like the K-cup or they're okay with like something. But I want to elevate their experience to the point where they want to go out and buy whole bean roasted coffee from local roaster because they just got inspired because it was an awesome cup of coffee. How do we get them some easy equipment that is affordable and very convenient for those who are conveniently minded to enjoy this kind of specialty beverage? Can we do it with this super pod? Or what did you find, Dan? Let me let me go to the next slide. You're gonna carry it out here a little bit. And then and then Marty, please Please uh, add, there we go. And, and the challenge right now for pods at home is that uh, the machines don't really exist uh, for at-home brewing. Now, uh, I, I carefully say that because there are some machines that are out there that do different things. And one of the interesting things you said is you got the three patties. Why not just, uh, you know, lay them one on top of the other? Senseo actually does that. Senseo has a brewer that has a, a single pod and then a double pod. So uh, the sing all the paper there trapping some of those uh, really important oils. I think we're good. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a problem with the, the PowerPoint for a little bit. Let me get some stuff. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Where the so that uh, they've got the two pods laying one on top of the other. The issue is that you're going to capture uh, some excess oil uh, going through all those layers of paper, which is going to uh, make the product deteriorate. Uh, so how do you overcome that? You want to make uh, a product that allows the pressure to, to push through one layer of, of paper rather than uh, what then ends up being three layers of paper for that second pod. So Actually, one, two, three, yeah, yeah, four. Yeah, so, so anyway, that's, um, that's part of the challenge, and, and uh, there aren't any other legitimate uh, paper pod brewers out there that are uh, formatted to work with every pod. So 
we're working with uh, several companies right now, developing the technology, developing uh, the experience for the consumer, because this has got to be something that um, ultimately challenges Keurig. Uh, if you're going to do it, you have to make it easy. It's got to brew in less than a minute. You have to be able to put the right amount of coffee in and, and brew the size cup that the consumer wants. And all those things have to come into play as the brewers are being uh, built out and engineered to make the best quality cup of coffee. The, and the reason this is really coming to a head is that the, the K-cups are uh, still, uh, there's still no solution uh, for the K-cups completely. You've got them in recycled material, but a lot of places don't take that uh, polypropylene. Um, and some of the material isn't recyclable. You, you still have to uh, dismantle it, take the lid off, take the, the filter paper out and things like that. People want something that uh, is more environmentally friendly. You get to the billions yeah. and billions that are sold these days. Uh, it's becoming an issue and, and the folks at home are really looking for a solution, but they want it to be easy to use. Uh, pour over is a five minute process. A uh, uh, French press is a, is a process cleaning up. Um, and, and batch brewing isn't necessarily what they want to do. Maybe they want a cup now and a cup in two hours. And they know that if it just sits there for two hours, it's not going to be any good. So you've well, got all the issues. Yeah. And I, and I think we, we've got, um, you've got some really interesting data here. I'm going to get to it before the hour runs out. And, uh, as far as you know, this new normal that you've put together here, this is really interesting. As of September 1st, you say that you've got 30% office, 40% hospitality, 50% restaurant, and then in January we're going to see you know uh, twice as many going back to the office, uh, 60%, 70% hospitality, 80% restaurant. I can kind of see that happening, but you know, COVID is COVID, and and uh, I, I'm going to just leave it at that. Like we, I, I think that 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 looks like a like an honest projection. Um, and, and this is interesting too, returning to work. Um, I, I hope this, I, I think we had some uh, issues with uh, me transitioning this uh, presentation over because I have a wider screen, but I'll read it through anyway. Uh, the return to work on January uh, uh, 2021, 60% will be in the office, 40% um, will 40 will still work from home. Is that right? That's correct. The benefits become important as employment falls below 5%. As unemployment falls, so so what happens right now with uh, the, all the companies out there that need less employees, uh, and there's a lot of employees to choose from? Do they have to create the benefits programs that um, that they'll need when unemployment falls below five percent? When it falls below five percent, you're struggling to find quality people and you're willing to give other benefits. They have to do the hospitalization, they have to do other certain benefits, and coffee is a benefit. It's not any more or any less. It's a benefit to the employees. If they stop doing office coffee, they're eliminating a benefit. If they re-up on the office coffee, which most of them will do, it's become uh, a productivity gain. They've seen all the data on this in the HR world that having coffee in an office uh, actually in improves uh, the productivity. It sure um, does. <laughs> yeah, there's no, yeah. There's so, no argument about that. That's absolutely. All about, right? Hey, right, that's but, no argument for me. And, and but if unemployment is, a, I'm sorry, if unemployment is above 5%, they take away some of these softer benefits. That's the point. And so uh, when does the office coffee operator go after the benefits manager of any company, the HR person, the admin, and bring this up as a benefit that needs to return and return to the people working from home. Absolutely. And, and that'll happen when, I think, when unemployment falls below 5%. I think we need to pay attention to that as an industry. I think we can, you know, we can have these dreams that certain things will happen sooner. But we, we're running businesses out there. What, and we have what happens when we have all the people that are going to be working from home permanently? Like, I know that, that there's a lot of uh, discussion about people, not the same 100% will be going back to work ever. There's a lot of people that's found that this transition saves money uh, as far as, you know, like uh, facility maintenance and whatnot, like having lo less, less workers in the office uh, 
have been more productive for some businesses, not all, maybe a couple examples, I don't know. I'm just kind of spreading rumors at this point. But how do you engage those uh, uh, those workers that are gonna remain at home? How do you get them to be a part of this office coffee service? You know, like, can, can they be included? Is there a plan there? Have you heard anything good about that? It, it would be a part of the benefits package. That's really what you'd want to do. So, so this slide shows that, you know, you really have to have a strategy when you're addressing this with the HR department and, and really talking about the benefits is an important part of it and uh, provide lots of solutions, provide things that are going to help these HR managers maintain their workforce and keep quality people employed working for them and being productive. So uh, this strategy basics and, and sorry, I have to hide this. Who, who wants the product? Why, why do we think this is important as an industry, as the office coffee industry? Um, what fits the opportunity? Do you have a delivery mechanism already in place or do you have to set up something new as an office coffee operator to do this affordably? You have to figure these kind of things out in business to make sure that that it is a solution. And why is your solution better than something else that's out there? These are all things that need to be addressed. And, and of course, the ultimate thing is, do you have equipment to install in these small locations? If you're talking about uh, delivering K-cups to homes? Do you have a K-50 if that's the, the small brewer number? Um, those are solutions and you have to be able to talk about these solutions fluently with the decision makers. Um, and, and so now the customer acquires the equipment. They can either buy it from the office coffee operator or a superstore or maybe the employees already own these machines. But one thing that the OCS operators have to understand is this does not require a return on investment. Somebody else has bought this machine, and, and the expectation uh, now is that you can provide product at a little lower cost. And, and as you go to market, you have to know your competition, be able to add value, and really own the account. And you do that uh, in different ways. One, who's the competition in this uh, at-home market? Is it Staples, Office Depot? Is it uh, Giant Peapod? Is it uh, Amazon Prime? What exactly is it? And how are you going to add value? Are you going to be bringing in local items that some of these uh, uh, operations don't carry? Are you going to bring in? I've got a great idea. I've got a fantastic idea. How do you add value? Every bag plants a tree or every employee that you have on your program, we're going to plant a tree for you. Uh, and I add think an that experience is... and, and why not, right? We're going to own that account and we're going to, we're going to engage with the community, with the office workers and say like, this is how you boost morale. You're doing the world a favor. You're planting some trees. Let's get those, let's, let's get these forests under, you know, good management, address climate change and plant some trees and start paying attention. And, and, and if you can anything still do that by drinking good coffee. Right, that's right. And if anything is proven to be uh, uh, positive in with the millennials and the Gen Zers, is have a cause, have a cause, and exploit the cause uh, because they want to own the cause. They want to be a part of some solution for society, for humanity. And, and so do I. I think I might be Gen X. I mean, I, but I, and I also want to own, and I want to exploit the quality of that coffee too. Like that, and that, that word's a little uh, harsh on, you know, uh, certain ventures, but I think that like, uh, you know, really s s knowing that your cup of coffee has a greater impact than just, you know, like little, you're just going to throw it away in the garbage. It took like, years to get there right you were talking about that earlier like the amount of time it takes to get to your to your to your possession there's so much time and energy has gone into that and the quality of that coffee uh matters to me i guess as as much as anything else but again what at, at what at, at what uh cost to the uh to the to yourself and to the planet and to the people in the future your kids did that th th these kind of interactions and these kind of consumption patterns take and what can you do to kind of work with that, alleviate it, you know, like kind of balance this out, right? And that's why I like those pods. Here's my, my other sales pick, right? If you want to talk about compostability, 
and about precision Absolutely. and not wasting coffee, right? We don't want to waste coffee. That's just that's just silly. And and Marty, you, we've been talking about espresso grinders being more and oh, more. The in technology life. of the grinders has saved more coffee in the last five, 10 years yeah. than any anything. And then the packaging that's housed around the pods are also with compostable film, potentially. Is that right, Dan? That's correct, yes. And is that like a new, that's about a year old? It's about a year old, yes. It's yeah. uh, And it's all BPI certified yeah. uh, materials. So uh, it's it's breaking down, it's composting, it's uh, uh, a solution. And and again, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're adding the value and and showing people what exactly it, it means. You look at the uh, billions of K-cups that uh, they talk about over and over and over again. Um, you know, it's an issue that, that is not fully addressed yet, and, but it's common, it's common. And, and I would say for the office coffee operators, figuring out uh, what other convenience items, alternative products, line extensions that they can uh, sell into these homes uh, and create a list for the for the HR department that's similar to what the employees at the office are getting. Uh, you don't want to um, take away a benefit uh, because somebody's working at home and probably because you've decided that uh, somebody should be working at home. These, uh, a lot of these companies will save a ton of money on their real estate if 30% uh, of their 40% of their people are working at home. Dan, let me, let me ask you this. You, you guys have obviously crunched some numbers on what percentage of people are no longer in the office, but they're at home. What you, this concept of the employer providing uh, coffee to the person working officing from home as a benefit intrigues me. It's something I hadn't thought of. It's obvious they, they might set them up for the computer. They might set them up for the camera. They, you know, stuff like that. But it, it's, I'm in the coffee business. Why didn't I think of that? That, Absolutely, they might do that. So what percentage are you seeing out there of the companies that that are swinging that as a benefit? What, are you seeing that much out there? Percentages are below 1% nationwide right now, and that has everything to do with the unemployment rate. Please keep in mind that HR managers start to get uh, a little funny about stuff when it gets below 5% and they can't find people. That's when benefits become really important, particularly the soft benefits. And this is one of the soft benefits. And uh, if you remember pre-COVID, we were down around the 3% uh, unemployment range. And, and I would argue that it was probably uh, less than 2% based on what I was seeing around the country over and over and over again and the inability to hire people and find people and so on and so forth that's when the benefits really become important and the the, the industry should have a plan that's all i'm saying here i'm not saying that this is tomorrow's plan for october um, the industry should have a plan for what's going on they need to build out this process they need to understand how to get customers customer approval, what the ordering process looks like. Is this going to be an online uh, setup that anybody can go into and then get they get administrative approval? Uh, do the operators expect to have order minimums? Are subscriptions a valid thing in this? And, and I would say that these are a lot of ideas that, that need to be uh, discussed. Uh, what are the authorized products that a company allows? A lot of times you go into to these tech companies, they've got full on kitchens, people making omelets for the for the techies coming in and, uh, you know, working all day. And and so what are the authorized products that that they're going to allow? And then really a, a, the mechanical side is how do you deliver it? What's your strategy? Are you going to send a truck around a neighborhood delivering a, a box of K-cups or, or a box of pods or two creams and two sugars? You have to have a, a strategy. for. Or are you would, gonna... And one of those strategies, Dan, would probably be reaching out to your local uh, OCS provider or, or someone who is a distributor of coffee products in your area and say, hey, we've got, a, we've got an idea for you. We just want to do fulfillment, right, with you. We have a plan. We, we have the relationship with the with the actual businesses and uh, with with the, our brands. 
and uh, ha have have some sort of relationship there. But I, I do believe that there's room here. I really think that there are people out there uh, that want to keep their employees awake at home and be like, wake up, drink some coffee, get to work. Zoom calls at nine o'clock. You got your free coffee. Where are you? Like, we can't give you any other drug to get to work, but we're just trying to keep you happy, right? At home. The kids are running all over the place. The dogs are barking. You're going to be late. You're like, oh, this doesn't work. I need a quick solution in my kitchen because I'm not a, a master coffee chef like, like John Ferguson or Marty Rowe or Dan Reagan. Like, you know, like, I, I think that there is room here. I know that it's less than 1%, but I think that I have faith that no matter what happens with this pandemic, there's going to be a, an increase of percentage of people working from home and an opportunity, like you said, maybe wait for that employment number to go down, but then you'll have this huge opportunity. If you sell it, they will come. I really believe it. I think NAMA, SCA, all these people, there's going to be a blend of I, I can see this, at least. Maybe that's just because I'm getting older, you know, hitting 45-ish. You know, it's like, well, oh, my taste buds are going. Maybe I'm a Q grader. I like good coffee, but you know what? I'll just take what I can get for a reasonable price. I'm not going to say that. I love – I had some of the best coffee from Mar Marcel today because uh, someone came through town and dropped me off a bag for coffee that was like – it was a natural process coffee, Marty, Dan. This is crazy. Natural process coffee. And then it dried down to whatever 18% moisture content, and then they washed it. They rehydrated it, washed off the off the the, the, the dried cherry, and then dried down again. And uh, it tasted like a natural process coffee. It was pretty good. But I don't want to sacrifice that. But you can put that in a pod if you can make it taste good. And then there's a story, and then you can sell that. I don't know. I love this stuff. I'm gonna stop rambling. Marty, you're kind of quiet. I want you to. No, no, kind of add to this. Well, what I, with the intrigue aspect of, of me seeing uh, home coffee or remote officing, um, I, uh, I also see an opportunity or some change necessary for the equipment suppliers, equipment repair people that's in my court. Um, if there's going to be an increase in that, we need to be cognizant of, of what those needs are going to be and what those trends are going to lead us as service providers um, will do. So we need to get more familiar with, with that. Um, I'm guessing that there's data out there right now, how many millions of uh, single cup brewers have, have already hit the counters since March of this year. Um, and what, what, What's it going to take to keep them running and or um, some of them, you know, if they're a $20 brewer, obviously that's going to be a replacement thing. But you, we might want to get in that, that chain um, as being a provider for that, too. You know, so that's, that's where I'm thinking. About, can I ask you about Bean to Cup, Marty? Have you seen a lot of Bean to Cup brewers out there? Have you seen more and more of them? Or is that uh, something that happened last year that's no longer happening now? Dan, well, I'll tell you where, you where we're seeing actual bean to cup where you're grinding it in the machine um, one cup at a time, we're, we're seeing an increase of that in uh, your waiting areas where they used to be, the consumer, I believe, was satisfied with that, that less than good quality cup that they would get. Well, I think the, the consumers are getting more savvy and um, the people that own the the car lots and the uh, office waiting rooms, hospital waiting rooms, things like that. They, uh, they want to provide a, a better product because the people are kind of demanding that. They've educated themselves on what a good cup of coffee is. So we are seeing an increase of bean to cup. And we're also seeing a, an increase of interest that hasn't really hit, hit the road yet, but in your drive through your major drive-through places, they are testing. They're, they're looking at what it's going to take to do um, one cup at a time um, brewers in a drive-through in your major restaurants. Your and chains. Dan, have, have, you, have you seen the same kind of growth in the bean to cup? Or where do you think um, that's going? Is that something we should be talking about? Well, so absolutely. Bean to cup continues to grow. Um, it, it allows, again, uh, for companies to use a local coffee roaster and and bring in a local product, and that that seems to be where it's uh, 
Uh, most popular technology on the machine is, uh, quite frankly, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of options that you can uh, add to the to the brew, and you can make it long, short. You can make an espresso. You can make a cappuccino. All sorts of good things. Some of those things uh, you can do with pod brewers as well, but the the bean to cups uh, um, are really more of a uh, customer friendly in in the sense that you have two different kinds of groups. You have uh, a static group of office workers or you have a transient group of people going through a car dealership. Different people every day going through. Those bean to cup machines are super easy. You place a cup, you hit a button, you maybe you hit the button, a few different buttons, you get something out. They've got technology now that, that uses a QR code so that the, the thing comes up on your phone and you can not touch the machine, but just uh, key it in on your phone and it'll brew. But it's a, a good thing for a, a transient group of people. The pods are better for really the static office. And, and the reason that that's important is that the bean to cup brewers uh, do require a fair amount of maintenance each day. They have a life cycle, number of cups that they can brew before they need some serious clean out. Because remember, you're grinding beans. There's a lot of dust. If you're putting dark, dark roast coffee in there, the, the channel from the grinder down to the brew mech jams up with because the coffee is really oily. Hey, it's, Marty, how much does that cost to repair? When you Have you ever seen that for one? Oh yeah, yeah, we we see we see that a lot. Typically, our service calls you you can do um, fix about anything on those in about an hour unless there's something major broke on it. But they it usually comes from the lack of that day to day that daily maintenance that, that he's talking about. If they do that on an everyday basis, and depending on how busy they are, it may need to happen more than once a day. But if they're keeping it clean and keeping the paper changed and and keeping things cleaned up then they won't see us all that often. Um, how but, often do you no, see, do see them when they, with, when they don't take care of it? How often are you seeing them? Is it like once a month, oh, once every six months? Once I, month? I'd say six to eight weeks. Um, oh, so that, that should give you some incentive to clean the thing, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I, and that's better, right? That, that, that goes, that's not just bean to cup or, or those type of machines. That's, that's every machine out there. You know, and, that, can that that every... to, and, and, and that actually and that even applies to your hands and your dishes that you use and your body and your hair and the, your glasses and, and you your car. Your glasses and every... <laughs> you know, imagine not cleaning your glasses for three months. Hey, right? are you talking about me? Yeah, and, and I'm just kind of like, come on. Oh, and I was thinking about this, guys. This is like way off the subject, but I was like um, driving uh, my daughter. My, my daughter had I, I I got her a pickup truck, a four wheel drive. You know. Because you know what? What do all sixteen-year-old uh, girls want? They want a four-wheel drive pickup truck, Ford Ranger. But I noticed that when I got in there, like she hadn't cleaned the windshield wipers in a while, and I'm like, what kind of, like, what kind of people don't clean their windshields? Like, you see people driving around with like all this bird crap on it, and like you can really, and I'm just like, are you the kind of person that like has a clean windshield, or are you the kind of person that doesn't have a clean windshield? And the people who don't have clean windshields, I can guarantee you, they're going to be calling you every six weeks. That's that's my that's my predicament. I don't know. Do you guys have a clean windshield? I can imagine you do. Meredy, I don't know. Maybe not. You're kind of rich. yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can't imagine not having a clean windshield, and I can't imagine not cleaning my equipment correctly every day. Uh, and and having a, a you know any kind of leftover oil or anything else uh, is going to compromise tomorrow's cup of coffee. It's really not complicated. Clean the equipment just like you clean any other dishes. It's uh, it's pretty important. You know, even if you just run a, a you know on a single cup, even if you just run a, a, a empty cycle, no cup or pot in it. And just run it through, clean the brew chamber. It takes, uh, you know, 30 seconds and somebody else is doing all the work. All you had to do is push a button. So <laughs> anyway, I yeah, think it's like a, a, most, just like windshield, windshield wiper fluid, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, most of these automated I mean, machines, the cleaning comes automated along with it. The technology is there. It makes it easy to keep it clean if you just do it. 
Well, hey, guys, I think that wraps it up. We're a little bit over an hour, and I, I had a great time. Dan and Marty, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. And uh, thanks, Dietrich uh, uh, Cook, who is you know keeping this all together and making it look nice and, and clean and fancy. Thank sure you. thing. Yeah, you know, some on-the-fly adjustments this time around. So, <laughs> you know, but it worked out. This it looked time. Nice. <laughs> this is a I think you like progress. to throw me a, a curveball, John, <laughs> on, a, on a few different things. Oh, this is always a work in progress and always great to have you here to work it out with us. And, uh, so uh, good night and uh, until next week. Uh, you know, I don't have any parting words other than just keep your hands up. Hey, and thank you, Dan. It was very nice chatting with you. And Dan, Dan, real, real, cool real quick, where where can people find PodPack? Uh, www.podpack, P-O-D-P-A-C-K dot com. And any anything um, else that you'd like to to pimp out with that? No, no, we're good. If they uh, <laughs> come to the site, they'll see what we do. They can find me on there, and uh, we're here to help if uh, if they have a need. We're here to help. Right on, and Marty, go ahead and let it, let us know where we can hit up uh, Workbench Coffee Labs, or or give you a call and with uh, with more questions. Uh, <laughs> www.workbenchcoffeelabs.com. Um, shop number is eight one six five two nine six zero six three. You're right. gonna get some robocalls. John, go ahead and you know get the Arbor Day wrapped Robo up. Robocalls coming along. Uh, yeah, Arbor Day Coffee uh, dot org, uh, or you could try Arbor Day. Uh, .org backslash coffee and you will end up in two magical coffee places. But uh, yeah, just give me a call 402-817-9991 that's my number. So if you have any questions call me. Alright. Thanks guys. That's it. Thanks, Thanks guys. Alright. Be safe.